that is really hard work. I mean, <laughs> especially, you know, the woodwinds, low woodwinds or brass and instruments like that, you know, oftentimes in orchestra they'll wait about, I don't know, 20, 30 measures before playing anything, and then they'll play like three things, and then they'll stop playing for a while. And, and uh, so they were playing constantly, and that is exhausting. But um, anyway, thank you, volunteers. That's for you. We wanted to work hard. Some of the early Church of Beethoven shows had uh, visual artwork, and uh, I want to draw attention to this up here. And uh, it's by David Cudney, who uh, takes care of this place, and he's absolutely awesome. And uh, it's, 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 it's incredible. It's, um, those are espresso bags that, um, that he kept from the espresso that we've served every morning here. He kept the bags. There, so there are 243 of them which um, accounts for each performance that we have done, 243 performances. And and there's like such a forward sense of hope in that little window for me. I think it's just, it's so brilliant. Thank you so much, David. That's just so awesome. We've had poetry from the beginning, right? The first show, is that right, Tony? Were you Second show, um, Tony Hunt approached Felix and said, let's get some poetry in here. And it's, t and he said, you're hired, and it totally works. And I'm so happy Tony is here. Tony and his wife, thanks, Tony. The first poet ever to, uh, to, uh, to work our stage. And we've got a return visit uh, today from uh, Richard Peck is here today. Richard, um, the way these programs, I don't know how these programs get put together, but um, many months ago uh, we knew Richard was coming and he had mentioned that he wanted to do some reminiscences of Italy. So we thought, oh, what piece would go great with that? Tchaikovsky's Souvenir de Florence, which are Tchaikovsky's reminiscences of Italy. And then we, a few months down the road, we were like, oh gosh, that's actually our fifth anniversary, so we need to do something for that. And so uh, the piece is obviously incredible, the Tchaikovsky, and so we thought the workers' union would go great with it, and then the strings. Anyway, there's no scientific approach here. It's just, you know. Anyway, exactly. Richard Peck, ladies and gentlemen. Hello there. Okay. Buongiorno. Benvenuto a tutti. Thank you for being here. The history of music is filled with Italian names from great composers like Giuseppe Verdi, known to his English-speaking fans as Joe Green, to the, uh, to the big voices like Enrico Caruso and Mario Lanza, smooth voices like Mel Torme, dubious voices like Louis Prima, Italians are all over the place, and our restaurant menus are heavily Italianate, pizza, macaroni, spaghetti, mortadella, lasagna, pepperoni, etc. That last one's not food. Um, for reasons no more significant than those, I'd like to teach you a little Italian and a few tips about Italy. You already know hundreds of Italian words, but you pronounce them Englishly. English words end in T-I-O-N, many of them. Nation, nutrition, constipation, <laughs> prostitution. Now, you pronounce those same words Italianly, and they end in zione. Nazione, nutrizione, constipazione, <laughs> prostitutione. The problem is you can't have much of a conversation using only the only words. So you need a few verbs and a couple of gestures. For two years, my family and I lived in Italy. On the ship's six-day voyage to Rome, I studied an 1888 instruction book titled, Acquire Italian Conversation Expeditiously. I memorized several sentences. What is the Pope's address? How many grams are in a kilo? And please fetch me a plate of boiled beef. I never used any of them. Uh, uh, according to that book, in 1888, Italians greeted a new friend by saying, I'm very pleased to make your acquaintance. In Italian, that's molto piacere di fare le sue conoscenze. In 1988, Italians said only piacere, pleased. 
I threw away the book. <laughs> and I learned by listening and looking. Learning Italian is easy. Learning Italy isn't. On arrival in Rome, our three-year-old suffered from Garibaldi's revenge. That's the urgent opposite of constipazione. <laughs> and I could buy some medicine at any pharmacia if, if I knew what to ask for. So I jerry-built a simple three-word question to ask the pharmacist. The question is, ha blank lay? Do you have, and then you fill in that blank. Very easy. Then I phoned my blessedly bilingual secretary to find the missing word. Pina, I said, what's the name of an Italian patent medicine for diarrhea? She said, diarrhea. I thanked her and hung up, mistakenly assuming that she had named the medicine when all she had done was to name the affliction. <laughs> and at the crowded corner pharmacy, I asked the pharmacist, ha diarrhea lay? <laughs> you got it, you got it. What I said was, do you have diarrhea? <laughs> Nearby customers got whiplashed looking at me. <laughs> Women giggled, men bit their fists. Do I have diarrhea? Repeated the pharmacist. Uh, in English, better than my Italian. Uh, no, do you? <laughs> it didn't seem all that funny to me, but the customers loved it. They, they hugged one another, repeating my question, and they laughed. <laughs> End of story? Not on your dolce vita. Uh, <laughs> For the next two years, every time I sneaked past the pharmacia, the, ph the pharmacist waved a greeting. And then he whispered to customers at the counter. And they all exploded with what was, I think was uncalled for glee. By the end of that month, I apparently mastered Italian uh, a little. Pina said that I spoke it like a clever four-year-old. And in two years, I never got any better. But my new mastery of Italian let me eavesdrop. I overheard a clerk in the pharmacy nickname me the Diarrhea American. Now, <laughs> knowing a foreign language is useful. Second Italian lesson. To speak Italian requires using your hands. Put down your coffee cup for a minute and, and count with me. Here's how Italians count. Uno, due, tre, not one, two, three. Now, this is one. This is two, and another way of saying it is two. This is three. Another way, well, skip that one. Um, <laughs> Italians, look at your hands and your expression instead of listening to you. I smoked in those days, and I went into a tobacco a tobacco shop and pointed at a pack of menthol cigarettes. The tobacconist handed me two packs, non-menthol. Remember? Two. I said, I asked for one. He was indignant. He said, I gave you two. <laughs> but no menthol. And I said, why? He said, only women smoke menthol. <laughs> what, what, what will people think of you? <laughs> now, his denial wasn't our feeble little, uh-uh. It was the Italian absolute refusal. It's stirred, not shaken. Like James Bond's martini, another Italian word. So I pointed at a pack of North Pole. I want the menthol. To protect my manhood, he said. <laughs> but his daughter had a sharper business sense. She said, they're for his wife. She grabbed my money before I could quit smoking. <laughs> she handed it to her papa to count, let him think he was in charge, otherwise he'd have to start smoking menthol too. Anyway, I said to her, uno per favore. She gave me two. <laughs> I learned to shop with my hands in my pockets. When my three-month tourist visa expired, I learned another Italian survival trick. The officer at the police station explained that my tourist visa could not be renewed, ever. But wait, if I left Italy and returned from Switzerland, got a new date stamped in my passport, I said, that's ridiculous. You know what a trip like that would cost? And then the light came on. There might be a cheaper way to get my passport stamped and a new visa. So I tucked a 10,000 lira note into my passport, $16, and pushed it across the counter and raised an eyebrow. He said, yes, that can work. <laughs> and a new entry date appeared where once 10,000 lira had been. Now, it was not a bribe. Call it a service charge. 
to authenticate my virtual re-entry into Italy, but, but I could envision another virtual re-entry every four months. That's 30,000 lira a year. The officer said, now, apply for a permanent visa. Your application will be denied when we act on it. They always are. I said, but he, he silenced me. While it's pending, you are legal. And if we lose your application, we can't deny it. <laughs> I laid a 10,000 lira note at the top of the application form. I said, do you lose many of them? <laughs> he said, now I have, to, I have to quote him exactly. He said, <laughs> he walked over to a filing cabinet, opened the drawer, took my application, dropped it behind the filing cabinet next to the wall, <laughs> closed the drawer. And it's still pending 30 years later behind that cabinet. I don't think that's where my 10,000 litter went. Now, licensing a car in the Eternal City was another, another problem. Every four months, I paid 5,000 litter for a money order at the post office, taped it inside the car windshield with a sum of 5,000 litter visible. 15,000 litter every year, I complained. Oh, Cara, no, 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 Pina said. Don't buy a 5,000 lira money order. Buy one for 50 lira. Then with a black pen, add two zeros. <laughs> that way it says 5,000. And everyone does that. I said, don't the police know? She tried to be patient with my American naivety. Certo, of course they know. That's why this year they raised the fee from 1,000 to 5,000 lira. Because last year, everyone bought a 10 little money order and added two zeros. It takes longer to learn Italy than it does Italian. Now, not, not all our discoveries were humorous. Learning Italy meant learning politics, too. A national election took place while we were there with the Communist Party on the far left, fascists on the far right. The day before the election, fascist headquarters in central Rome blew up and burned to the ground. The communists were blamed. The fascists picked up five seats in the National Assembly before the public learned that they had blown up their own building. <laughs> the press called that the strategy of terror. To maintain authority or increase your power, blame your enemy for your failings. If you can't find an enemy, create one. Create fear. Get the public on your side. Claim there are weapons of mass destruction even when there are none. Swear you know where they're hidden. You could even start a war to find them. <laughs> the Italian press called that strategy of terror. I titled my new thriller, Strategy of Terror, Thanks to the Press. There's another Italian mystery. All Italian males claim to have frequent romantic affairs. But with whom? Because no Italian woman has ever been unfaithful. That's an article of faith, they know. Now, it must be thousands of foreign female tourists, French and German especially. But how did all those women get their visas? <laughs> For three years, three, I wrote a humorous travel column from the Albuquerque Tribune till the Tribune went broke. Uh, not entirely my fault. Um, I collected 52 columns in traveling at my desk. A dozen of them have to do with Italy. So I'm saying I wrote about Italy in, in two different versions, serious, frivolous. Two. <laughs> then recently I recorded one hour of those same Italian stories on this CD and on this flash drive or thumb drive. <laughs> the same 10 stories recorded in two different media. Two, not one. <laughs> Italy is full of interesting stories. Molto divertente. Brava, brava Italia, viva Italia. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Grazie tanto, molto grazie. Thank you.